Thank you all for being here today. My name is Rebecca Trawick. I'm the director and curator of the Wignall Museum at Chapey College. Thanks so much for joining us today at today's artist talk featuring Susan Brand, presented as part of our current exhibition, Reunion. Reunion brings together works of art and the written word from faculty and staff who teach and support instruction at Chafee College. Reunion is on view at the Wignall Museum through March 11th, 2023. So today I'm pleased to introduce illustrator Susan Brand. Susan Brand grew up in the spare beauty of the desert Southwest where she fell in love with drawing and observing nature at an early age. She attended Art Center College of Design, earning a BFA in illustration and advertising before moving to New York City. After an early career in animation and design, she discovered natural science illustration and found her joy. Brand is known for images of botanical and natural science subjects presented with brevity and acuity. She illustrated the cover of The Sound of a Wild Snail Eating by Elizabeth Tova Bailey, and recently provided interior illustrations excuse me, interior illustrations for Forager, Field Notes for Surviving a Family Cult, a memoir by Michelle Dowd, who is with us today. Hey, Michelle. Uh, and who is also a professor at Chafee College. Uh, Michelle is a professor in journalism and English at Chafee College, and she's currently on sabbatical and a book tour as Forager is launched this week, actually tomorrow evening, at the Sam and Alfreda Maloof Foundation. Susan's studio is located in Maplewood, New Jersey. So please join me in giving Susan a warm virtual welcome. Hello, thank you. Um, it's nice to see this many people here. Hello, Michelle. Um, I'm going to share my screen and get started. Start at the beginning. I was born in El Paso, Texas. Um, it's at the western tippy tip of Texas and sandwiched between New Mexico and Mexico. The city itself is wrapped around this mountain and you either lived on the east side or the west side. We lived on the west side. It's beautiful desert. Um, the colors changed constantly. It's a very subtle beauty and the sunsets were spectacular. I grew up in this house. My father was a home builder and he built our house. Uh, you can see the mountain behind. Uh, when we were kids, we were basically told to go play. You know, parents didn't want to see us. They didn't, they wouldn't engage with us. They uh, sent us out to play. So we often just uh, ran around until the street lights came on. But one of the obvious things to do is go explore the desert and we got very familiar with rocks and seed pods and thorns. I think we've spent most of our childhood pushing each other into cactuses, um, looking for snacks, looking for fossils. And if we were really, really quiet in the desert, you could easily see um, all of this wildlife, including that rattlesnake, which uh, I guess we were smart enough to stay away from most of the time. Another big influence growing up was the colors of living on the border. Um, everything was really colorful and festive. Um, and the, the border was very porous at the time. A lot of people had family on both sides of the border. Some people lived on one side and worked on the other. It was a lot more porous than it is now because of national security and the food was spectacular. One of the places that I love to visit that was about a half mile walk from my house was the University of Texas in El Paso. So you can see it's Bhutan architecture, Himalaya on the border. Um, the Natural Science Museum was filled with curiosities. It's a little more uh, standardized now. At the time, it was kind of like a Victorian cabinet of curiosities. And the curators were very patient. We asked a lot of questions and they were happy to fill us in. The other place I like to visit was the museum. They started you know, taking us in school trips. When we were kids, there was a world-class collection. The owner of a local department store had acquired a Botticelli and 
Byzantine paintings on wood, as well as Spanish and Mexican folk art and modern, modern masterpieces. I loved school. School was my place. Uh, school was my safe place. And I got really high grades, really good grades. Um, and I always, always, always was drawing. I drew everything. I always had a, a paper with me and pencils. I assumed that I would continue to see all the people I'd always known and grown up with all the way through high school. And at the high school, I was uh, in the drama club and a you know, cheer person and uh, painting murals in the cafeteria, very involved. In the middle of my sophomore year, my mother surprised us with a move to Chula Vista, California. So out of the blue, <laughs> I was living somewhere where I didn't know a soul. Uh, everyone already had their friends. I wasn't sure what was in store for me. And I had art though. I continued to make art. Unfortunately, unfortunately the high school that I went to had one art class and it was okay, but there was a graphic arts class and a vocational curriculum. So, this was way before computers. I'll give you a little context for that soon. Everything had to be done with a T-square, a triangle, and an X-Acto knife. And that's me using an X-Acto knife at age 16. And we learned how to print on a press similar to the one in the picture. And we did the school newspapers and memo pads and silkscreen bumper stickers. There was a dark room. There was everything you needed to have a little print shop. And that turned out to be a really good place for me to spend time. This, we also had a photo typositor machine. And this was how you could get type headlines. You had to type it in and this machine developed the photography um, on reels of negatives. There was letters and you could make headlines. That was the, the big news there. This is what a personal computer looked like at that point in time, just to give you some context. I also worked in a bookstore and discovered underground comics. I love, love, love underground comics. I love comics of any kind. Also working in the bookstore was really amazing because there was every single book and magazine available in San Diego County at this bookstore. And I learned a lot about um, how books were stocked, how they were merchandised and magazines as well. And I could look through any magazines I wanted. Um, since it was the end of high school, the mode was for everyone to decide what their career was gonna be. And I just always assumed I'd be an artist. I was getting pressured by the guidance counselor to look into science and math, but I really wanted to be an artist. And one of the guidance counselors told me you could be a commercial artist. And I thought that sounded savvy. Um, you, could make, you could make money making art because I just couldn't imagine acquiring enough patrons to make a living at, for my paintings, but I love the idea of commercial art. In the high school library, there was a magazine called Graphis Magazine. And I used to go on my lunch hour and just pour through these magazines with these amazing illustrations and you know, important looking design. And over and over, I could see that the designers being profiled had gone to Art Center. And I mentioned that to the librarian and a week later, she said, I've got something for you. And this yellow square was the catalog for Art Center College. And I thought that was slick already. Art Center College looked really business-like and really important. And it looked like some place that I could learn how to make all those slick arty things in the Graphies magazine. And people were obviously making things and treating it very seriously. And I, I really wanted to go there. And then I saw the painting studio 
And I figured that would be a dream. And actually the man in the center in the back uh, talking like he knows what he's doing was one of my uh, painting professors. So to go to Art Center, you would need a portfolio. My graphic arts teacher was also the photography teacher and he started photographing all of the art I'd accumulated up and that point. This is uh, my high school art, including the memo pads we made in the print shop. And uh, you could tell it was the 70s. <laughs> And uh, the way that you would present a portfolio in 1979 was on slides. So back to El Paso, I started college at the University of Texas, the Himalayan looking uh, university. And I took printmaking and got all of my general education out of the way. So I wouldn't have to be doing that at Art Center. And I applied to Art Center figuring I'd been told it would take a few times to apply and get in. And I also met my people. I realized other artists were lots of fun. Other artists understood all the weird things that I thought and did. And other artists were willing to dress up like wizards at the drop of a hat. And I did get into Art Center on the first try, I was not expecting that. And so I moved to Pasadena. I didn't know a single person. All I knew was I was accepted to Art Center. And it really did look like this, which blew me away. And everyone did seem to always have something to do. And I did end up taking the painting classes and I ended up making weird stuff in the shop. And I met more of my people and that was, Fantastic. I'm still in touch with so many people that I went to Art Center with. And now came the hard part, looking for work. Now you're out of school. Um, I was still in LA. And what did you do? You put a portfolio together. So I took my life drawings and my packaging and the art I'd created and put in a big portfolio. And you would call people and you'd call art directors and designers and record cover designers and you'd go to their studios, you'd bring your big portfolio and you'd put it down and then maybe they'd have a light box and they'd look at your slides. And hopefully all the other designers would gather around and you'd give everyone business cards or postcards and that way they'd remember who you were in case they had something that you could do. So I, I got a couple of design jobs. I met every single record designer at Warner Brothers. And it was a, a lot of driving around and a lot of discouragement and everyone I knew was moving to New York. And I finally got a job painting mat cells for a special effect for a Burger King commercial. Those are flying hamburgers and Pepsis. And I was basically in a, a spare studio painting black paint onto cells to mask that stuff off. And I got home and there was a message on my answering machine and a friend of mine who was a, now a art director at J. Walter Thompson in New York was in town and wanted to see if I wanted to hang out. And she was in town for a shoot and she was shooting this commercial. So I went from doing the mat cells on the flying hamburgers and I went and met her on set and we had a great time. And she told me how great New York was and we went back to her hotel. And right at the last minute, I parked my car and I took my portfolio with me. I still don't know why. This was in West Hollywood. And at the time, a lot of cars were getting towed because they had really bad signage for parking. And you could come out and your car would be gone. You'd have to go get it out of impound because of parking laws. Well, my car was gone, but it was, it was stolen. And I was there with my portfolio and no car in Los Angeles. A week later, they found my car, it was totaled and I got all my insurance money. And at that point I had a decision to make, did I wanna to start to buy another car or did I wanna go somewhere where I didn't need a car with a little nest egg? This is what personal computers looked like in 1984 and I moved to New York. So New York City, I was, as I was taking my portfolio around, I was making lots of other work. 
um, I started making these shrines, these three-dimensional boxes, and I started selling them in little galleries and to people. And again, I was taking my portfolio around with the new work. I went to see lots of uh, designers. I went to record companies. I got a little regular gig doing illustrations for Electra Records. And the director uh, in Los Angeles that I had done the effects for called me up and he said, listen, go see R.O. Blackman. He's looking at portfolios. And everyone wanted to know who was looking at portfolios because you could call up and show your portfolio and it was if they were open you know or were slow and would looking at uh, young illustrators work so i got prepared and i was really nervous because i'd seen arlo bluckman's illustrations on the new yorker and at the time there was a commercial running that had the perrier caveman and it was in his style he was a really nice guy it was in this building on uh, 47th Street on the Jewelers Exchange, the top floor of that building. And inside, it was like a medieval castle. The people who had built that studio out at the turn of the century had designed St. Bartholomew's Church. This fireplace was huge. The whole room was paneled with wood. The ceiling was sculpted. There was leaded glass windows. It was an incredible room and I was completely intimidated and almost not listening. And he, he liked my portfolio. He was held things upside down and looked at them. And at one point he said, can you set type? And I said, yes, I know how to set type. And he said, okay, can you, can you start tomorrow? And I thought he was offering me a little, a little gig, uh, setting some type for him. And then he said, but you'll have to learn animation. And I didn't understand it all. And then he took me downstairs, one floor down. And there was an entire animation studio <laughs> with people working and work tables. And they were making commercials. And they were finishing a feature-length film that he, in his style, called The Soldier's Tale. And it was uh, airing on, about to air on PBS. And what he needed me to set type for was a circle sticker that was going to go on the VHS package. And I started working in the animation studio the next day. I joined the union and I met other people. That's me at my animation desk. Um, it was an amazing place to work. First of all, he was animating the style of every illustrator I admired. We were animating Seymour Quast and Stephen Granaccia, um, Brad Holland. Um, it was insane. And every Friday, he would host a lunch and invite whatever illustrator he was hanging out with the time to talk to all of us. And it was a great way for all of us to connect with each other. Um, one time he had uh, Art Spiegelman came and Mouse had just come out and we all got signed copies of Mouse, you know, just on and on. It was a real privilege. So I worked there for three years. Um, the first, within the first two weeks of working there, I got a strange assignment that made the, uh, the sales rep panic. Blackman had started the storyboard and got into the sixth frame and then left town and basically asked me to finish the concept, make the storyboard, present it to the client without him approving it. And <laughs> I panicked and did it. I came up with the idea of using shadow puppets and it actually got produced and the representative was, okay, hopefully this will play. So I 
Yeah, thank you. I made it out alive. Um, during my time there, um, we worked on hundreds of commercials over the course of the three years that I worked there and uh, and a couple of chances to use my collage style on spots too. This special presentation of The Nutcracker is made possible by a grant from IBM. We offer this celebration of the holiday season with the very best wishes of IBM people around the world. This special presentation of the Vienna New Year's Day concert is made possible by a grant from IBM. We offer this celebration of the new year with the very best wishes of IBM people here and around the world. Trying to keep up with business communications is enough to make anyone feel lost. Fortunately, they're the 9X advisors. Experts who conquered the toughest communications territory. They'll show you what you do need and what you don't. In phones, integrated voice and data systems, networking too. So you and your system will feel right at home. 9X Business Information Systems. Communications without complications. So after three years and hundreds of commercials, um, it really was a, a super amazing experience, but I wanted to get back to painting and doing illustrations. Um, also, Blackman was super, super picky um, perfectionist. <laughs> One of the last things he had me do is he wanted an uh, exit sign for the studio. And you could see, like, you finally use this. Um, and I knew the one way that I could think of something, the one thing I could design would be his own handwriting because then he couldn't critique the font I used or whatever. So I had him write the word exit and then blew it up on the Xerox machine. And I had left it on my, uh, on my desk and gone to get the supplies to cut the mask to make the sign. And I came to my desk and I saw this little note that says, Susan, I retouched the X on this, bottom right, Bob. And I couldn't figure out what he changed. It looked exactly the same. And then I realized he added this little bump on, on the X. So that pretty much sums up what it was like to work for him. It was a little stressful, but like I said, it was an incredible, incredible uh, experience. And I went freelance. I was self-employed. Um, I started getting more illustration work. Um, I still was doing my newsletter for Electra. I was doing some package design. And I was also still doing animation. And after a few years, um, I'd uh, gotten a little reel together. So I'll play that. Hopefully this one won't be as loud. Checks the classic taste Checks the classic crunch The classic taste that can't be beat The real taste of corn, rice and wheat Checks the classic crunch This classic crunchy shape of checks lets the milk burst through and the timeless taste stay in Checks the classic crunch Think, is there only one choice for office typewriters? Think again. Think again. Canon typewriters are sturdy and reliable, with text editing power and speed, and custom features that make all your office work effortlessly beautiful. So if you think there's only one choice for office typewriters, think again. it pays to think twice. Think again. selection of fresh foods on our all-you-can-eat fresh plastics food bar. Who says you can't please everyone? The all-you-can-eat fresh plastics food bar, free with every dinner, only at Bonanza. 
QB the 2B bringing you beautiful true blue TV delight. QB the 2B, I love what you do because you bring me Nick at night. So you get a, a little sense of what uh, we were doing in the late 80s in New York City animation. Um, film is incredibly collaborative. The Chex commercial, we had 15 artists um, emulating Norman Rockwell. Uh, the director shot all of that footage with costume models cast to look like the people in the paintings. And then we dismantled the footage and made, you know, blew up prints of each frame and painted on the frames. The stop motion commercial, that's all plastic food. That's all food that we cast and sculpted and painted and made. And the animator, that was 18 hours straight that he shot that spot. He went on to become um, the head of animation at Sony Pictures. <laughs> and, um, you know, people went on to other things, but it was an incredible, uh, incredible experience and with amazing people. Um, at about that time, I was getting so much work and I was having people come work in my apartment, which was very annoying to my landlady. So I ended up uh, renting studio space on Union Square. The building on the left is my building. I was on the top floor, the arched windows, and my view was the view on the right out those arched windows. And I don't think I appreciated it at the time, but it was a great location and it was very official. And, you know, I was a serious person at that point. Uh, about that time, I got a call to go to New Mexico, the same director that I'd worked on the Burger King commercial with that had given me the heads up on the ink tank, was shooting a film in Southern New Mexico and remembered I was from there and we had a few meetings and I ended up doing all of the production design, choosing the costumes, um, hiring the scenic, um, finding cars, this was before cell phones in the middle of New Mexico. It was pretty uh, challenging. It was amazing. It was. Uh, it took six months to shoot. You know, get everything together and shoot everything. And eventually, the film got released. Um, the director of photography. I think the next project for him was Sling Blade. Um, it was not the first movie I worked on. I'd already worked on three or four movies in the, the set department and doing pre-production for movies. So it wasn't like out of the blue. I got a call the last month I was in New Mexico um, from someone I'd worked with at an effects firm. And he was telling me that I was going to want to work on the next project he had and that I should call him the minute I got back to New York. And so I did. Um, heads up, this is what a personal computer desktop looked like at this point. This is 1991, and I was going to get super familiar with this. Oh, I, I also owned a Newton, just fun fact. Um, the project he called me on <laughs> was uh, CD Interactive. They really don't exist anymore. We used to call it the 8-track of the 90s. Um, we were licensed to do Flintstone's Jetson's time work. Flint, Fred Flintstone went to George Jetson's world. George Jetson went to Fred Flintstone's world. It was basically an explore game where you just clicked on everything you possibly could and animations would happen. And right as we were finishing that job, um, I got called by a friend who was working at at and on a super secret, top secret, interaction, uh, interactive television trial. We weren't allowed to tell anybody what we were doing. I worked here for three years. No one knew what I was doing. And when I showed up for work, I saw a lot of people that had disappeared from the freelance scene and realized they were all here in this building in lower Manhattan, inventing interactive television with, there was probably a hundred people, 25 people in the art department, about 30 programmers. 
Everyone was really great. It was a really great group of people to work with. I designed uh, for computer generated imagery, the fantasy baseball. We were the sports team. Our team was the only team that finished our application and had it up on the server just in time for the whole project to be canceled. So the project was canceled. <laughs> we had one last party. We couldn't bring spouses. We could only have one drink. And so almost as a goof, uh, we all decided to dress up, crazy dress up, to make it the best hilarious party we possibly could. Um, the woman on the left ended up being my producer for the next 10 years. Uh, what happened was we were all still getting our day rate and the people who hired us weren't there to fire us. So there were people still showing up every day and clocking in and getting their day rate, which seemed appropriate at the time. And at one point, the programmer that working on my project pulled me aside. He goes, you know, we still have clients. And I said, like who? And he said, the NFL. Yeah, so we, we have to give them something. So we invented this game called uh, Two Minute Warning. This, this is HTML1. And by doing this game, the programmer taught me how to do the HTML markup language. It's not, and he told me this isn't a programming language, it's a markup. And it actually reminded me of specking type. There was not WYSIWYG programs. On the right, you see, you literally had to type everything. You had to know what all those tags meant or nothing would work. And you'd go back and forth to your browser to see if things were working. And it was a really interesting way to learn HTML, but we did it. So now it's 1995, left there and got work on a, a desktop computer game. This is how far things had come in just a few years. Now it's a CD-ROM, it's GearHeads, it's a Twitch game. Uh, I, my, I subcontracted, so my company did all of the animation, the graphics, the logo, the interface design. Uh, I had a team of five people working on my end and RGA had probably 20, 20 programmers doing the programming. I animated all the uh, explosions, any 2D effects, and did the color design as well. And it did really well. It got really good reviews, but it only worked on a desktop. I saw it five years later in a $2 bin at a Rite Aid or something. <laughs> but uh, it was a good experience. Um, the logo um, was done by my friend, Laura. Uh, Laura, I'd worked with in animation. She'd worked at at and We called her in to do the logo on Gearheads because she was such an amazing typographer. Um, this is my leave behind that I would leave it. And this is before I even had my own website. Um, this is for my studio. This is what a browser looked like. This is 96, 95, 96. This is what my website looked like. I had a, my actual website. Um, and I had started pitching. I didn't want to work in advertising. And right away, the internet turned into a place for advertising. And I started uh, pitching projects to different companies. And my favorite place to go pitch was the Museum of Natural History. Because you could bring whatever idea there was, they really didn't even have a website yet. They just had their, you know, name at the top of the page, and you could pitch to whoever and have like three-hour discussion about intelligent life in the universe and go look at all the dioramas. And it was really amazing, and I loved the people there. This website is still. They still use content from this website. It was one of the only early learner websites that they had. Um, it was simple, you know, exploring nature activities. And I worked with a friend of mine who taught uh, second and third graders at Friends Seminary. My friend John is an incredible educator. And one of the projects we did <laughs> was uh, the subway system with his class. So six and seven and eight year old kids helped me do this website. 
and they were really savvy and they were asking me how much RAM my computer had, something I'd never heard six, seven, and eight-year-old kids ask. But my favorite thing they were impressed by, they thought I was so cool because I could touch type and not look at the keyboard. And I'm nothing like a seven-year-old telling you that it's cool that you could type. This is their, their interactive subway system. So one of the last uh, animation jobs I did, I think it's actually the last broadcast animation job I did was um, this one. This is the head to eat. Have a little, little kitty face's tail. This <laughs> is a little bunny. Hop, hop, hop. So that was pitched to me, and it was pitched to Nick Jr. by my friend Kalman, who I actually went to Art Center with, and he lives in LA now, he's a filmmaker. And we had so much fun reconnecting and working together. I started getting a little burnt out. I had little kids. Um, I just wasn't feeling it. Uh, I was still getting a lot of calls for work, but I decided to closed down my studio. I had saved a lot of money and just put that aside and took some time to spend with my kids. And in my... So um, basically I went back to the land. I started um, gardening and doing programs with kids and hiking and foraging and medicine making. I joined the board of the conservancy in my town. And um, we were basically taking out invasive plants and planting in new plants and learning about trees and cultivating the wildflower preserve. And it was really a great experience. Around that time, I decided to take an illustration class because I thought, well, wouldn't it be nice to learn watercolor and paint flowers? And I took a class from my friend, Mindy Lighthype. And we became really good friends. Her studio was in the next town. She had open studios. We spent days and days and days just finding things to draw. She was the person that I could just go and like pull up mushrooms with and throw them on a table and paint them. And she introduced me to the woman at the bottom of the screen, Patricia Wynn, who worked at the Museum of Natural History. And she's been a freelance illustrator there for 40 years. She's freelance, she's contract, and they gave her an office. If you go in the mammalogy department at the Museum of Natural History, where the offices are, where the scientists work, every single piece of artwork on the walls is something she did. She's an amazing person, and she's talked me into joining. These are some of the illustrations I did in the years after that. And I joined the Guild of Natural Science Illustrators, and I got a job. And the person who recommended me for this job was my friend, Laura, the person who'd worked at at t who did the GearHeads logo, had moved to North Carolina and was working at Algonquin. And they were having trouble. They were using a photograph of a snail and she emailed it to me. And she says, what's wrong with this? And I said, well, they flipped the photograph because the spiral on the shell is going the wrong direction. And she, she had the creative director call me. <laughs> she goes, okay. What? And I said, it's not the species that's mentioned in the manuscript, et cetera. So they hired me to do the cover of this book. And it was uh, of just a beautiful memoir about a woman's uh, chronic illness and how she dealt with it by slowing her life down. And in, metaphorically, um, someone had given her a snail and the title alludes to the sound of the snail chewing on a leaf in the middle of the night. She could hear it eating. And it was a beautiful book. Um, I don't think Algonquin thought it would do as well as it did, but it did very, very well. Um, there, I also added a fern for the paperback and it's all over the world. There's no market that this book isn't still in print. That was a really nice experience. And I'm actually good friends with Elizabeth now. I continued to do natural science illustration and Patricia Wynn 
tricked me into joining the Salma Gundy Club, an art club in New York City. We do monotypes. I'm doing one tomorrow night. I have monotype parties once a month. I've met many, many, many more of my people. Every single person in that photograph on the lower left is a printmaker. Uh, it's just a joy. I was the uh, chairman for the Junior Scholarship Committee. So artists aged 21 to 35 would get special uh, membership rates for this club and have uh, their own exhibits twice a year. Um, I continue to do natural science illustration. I go uh, to the museum once a month and sketch with Patricia after hours. And then Forager came last year and I was really, really happy. Again, Laura recommended me to the new creative director at Algonquin and the project just sounded amazing. I was a little too eager. <laughs> I should probably have negotiated a little bit more um, I, they didn't assign me a scientist to vet the work, which is interesting, but I had access to a lot of people that could look and tell me if I'd gotten anything wrong. I worked in pencil. Um, the turnaround time was tight. There were 17 illustrations. I had a, a month to do the pencils and a month to do finals. And I, the creative director and I had a great relation. We never even talked on the phone. I think we just emailed. Um, I you know, fed him a few at a time. I didn't want to do 17 illustrations and then find out they were wrong. So I, I fed him five at a time or three at a time. And uh, he didn't ask for any changes, which made me really super suspicious. But, and he kept saying, and then you'll add your flair. And I didn't know what he was talking about. But so I just did what I did. And uh, I guess I added my flair because there were no changes. Um, actually, he did, he did make some suggestions on some of the layouts. And I actually used all his suggestions. They were really good. So as you can see, um, these appear to be, which what the contracted um, ink drawings and I actually am a really good inker. I can work on Bristol, but it was a tight schedule. So I made a Photoshop brush. I actually inked the entire thing in Photoshop. So there's 17 illustrations. I just dish up nine here. All right, here's my advice, everybody. Um, we, you know, well, obviously I'll take some questions. Um, any, anyone who's doing any kind of freelance or selling design, get this book because it tells you what the going rate is for everything, everything from fabric design to a spot illustration, to a cover illustration, to a magazine illustration, to a local newspaper illustration. It's worth getting, get this book. Um, all of these links, um, I have a link that I'll put in the chat on my website. You don't need to, you could do a screenshot if you want, but these are all, find your people, find your people, find your people. You're a, a strange animal if you're an illustrator, if you're an artist and you need to be around other people like you. You don't wanna reinvent the wheel. You don't want to wonder what you should be charging for an illustration. You get that book. You don't want to wonder, you know, what's the best gouache. Meet people. Go to meetups. Go to uh, volunteer. There are so many people that have volunteered at the SCBWI conventions that now have books because they learn so much. Um, the Guild of Natural Science Illustrators is another really good organization. If there's a local chapter, people love to share information and you want to be around people that share their information. If you ask someone how they did something and they don't tell you, that's lame. You tell them, you know, you tell them how you did it and always pay it forward if someone helps you out. Closer to home, I know you guys are in LA. There's a Society of Illustrators of Los Angeles, the most cumbersome name ever. Um, their website could use a little help, but it's a really good organization. They're really nice people. And I think Brad Holland is a member. Um, and also meet up, not in a creepy way, and sorry for repeating uh, World Wide Web twice, 
Um, but Meetup is, uh, be specific when you do your searches. Uh, I found life drawing, people that want to go out and sketch in parks, people that want to go to museums, other people, that's what you want to do. Thank you, Susan. Thank you. Um, I want to make you aware that there are a lot of um, props and kudos in the chat. So oh, thank you. If you can, <laughs> definitely take a look at that. Okay. Um, so I'm happy to answer, ask any questions that you all have uh, in the chat, but if anyone would like to share their own, would like to voice it, you're more than welcome to do that as well. Does anyone want to step up or should I hop into the chat? Okay, so uh, Malik, uh, Ms. Brand, have you ever made an animation for a movie or a short film? But like for the entire movie? I don't know, where's Malik? Malik. <laughs> Can you clarify for us, Malik, if you don't mind? Oh, uh, well, I meant for, you know, uh, have you made an animation for the entire movie? Oh, no, I haven't. No, that's like a, just so much work. Like if, if you got a job like that, then that's your life's work. I did a short film and it took me seven years of all of my spare time and all of my spare money. Well, and, um, yeah. well, are you are you currently doing animation now? I'm I'm actually not. I'm doing I'm doing some gifts. I haven't. I'm cured. I have don't really want to do animation <laughs> right now, but um, you know th that could change. That could change if I get inspired. I will definitely do animation. Thanks, Malik. Thank you, Susan. Um, okay, Melanie, she said, have you ever worked on any projects that had a long narrative storyline, like a story with characters? I am currently working on a graphic novel. It's like an early learner graphic novel, and it's about, uh, yeah, it's long, and it, it's tedious to work on, um, and I'm really enjoying it. Uh, Jasmine asks, how did you feel when you created your animation? How do you feel when you accomplish it or, or it's, it's kind of, yeah. it's kind of magical. I mean, um, it's a long process to animate by hand. Um, even that, that last, the hopping bunnies, that was entirely digital, but you're still literally animating every frame and making decisions on every frame. So it's really easy to get caught up in the minutia. It's really important to plan. If you don't have a storyboard, things fall apart. If you don't have your timings, things fall apart. It's uh, any, any long-term project really needs a outline, a skeleton, and then you work from there, you get. And, and when I first started in animation, those storyboards had to be so nailed down because you were asking all these people to do all this work and spending all this money Every concept had to be so solid. And now you could just try things on your computer. That could be part of the reason why I'm just not in, as enchanted by animation these days. But um, it was always magical to see it. And But you kind of knew it inside out. Like you'd seen it a million times. You knew every single frame. So it was really great to do. There was um, actually one thing I left off the list is the organization ASIFA. I know LA's got a big ASIFA um, constituent, but ASIFA East in New York, once a year there's a film festival and you could show, and we showed our commercials and to see an audience watching it in a theater, that's when you realize like, oh, we did something. We did something interesting. We did something special. The, Nor the Norman Rockwell piece was uh, technologically astonishing. It won a Clio award and it got a lot of attention for the studio that produced it. And, but, you know, we, we knew every frame of that by the time we saw it all together. Um, so yeah, it was, it's magical, but a lot of it was like being in the trenches with other people making. Thanks, Charmaine. Do you have a question? On your in your sketchbook and and from your presentation, you obviously have a lot of different kinds of art that you do. Um, and I noticed in your sketchbook, you have a lot of very detailed pen work, and then also a lot of very colorful, loose, landscapey, beautiful mm -hmm. stuff. And then the monotype stuff. Do you have 
you know, a current favorite or what you would go to if you weren't doing something for a commission or for work, mm -hmm. but would just sit down and do it for fun? Do you have a current favorite? My current f favorite is kind of semi tight oil painting. I've been doing a lot of still lifes. I mean, I look at the base of it, I'm a colorist when I paint. And so it's, I'm looking at light and form. And sometimes I want to paint really tight, but sometimes I like, you know, something loose. A lot of the time, loose paintings are sketches for tighter paintings, like they're more concept art. But yeah, when I was uh, working in illustration, I was also used as a copy artist for publishing. I can work in just any style, which was really valuable in the animation world because you had to replicate different people's style for and be consistent with it. And we used to have a running joke, we'd call each other dialist style. You know, like, <laughs> what's your style? People were like, what's your style? And I was like, I don't know. I don't know what my style is, but um, I've, I've made peace with that. So, you know, that's that, but that's a, a persistent question. Thank you. Do you think you have a flair because you're, you're genuinely interested, right? You, you, talk, so. you talk about the landscape, you talk about gardening, foraging, all of that. Yeah, I, th I think um, I was uh, working with, there was an illustrator, Lilla Rogers. I think she's a rep now, actually. She's a, a very successful rep and she has, she teaches classes. A lot of people go into teaching how to get illustration work because there's not that much illustration work. Um, and, but one of the things she says, and this is so true, people buy your joy. People buy your joy. Like if I sell fine art, it's often because I had a joyful time. I just, the bunny that's on the, my, the front of my website right now just sold last week. I loved making it. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it is, yeah, there's something strange about that. But if you really joyfully did something and it's authentic, people are drawn to that. So you just said something. You said there's not much illustration work. Can you talk about that? What choices are being made in the commercial space that well, what's happened, what's happened in the last 30 years or so is um, schools were really pumping out a lot of graduates coming out with illustration portfolios and maybe kind of having a formulaic idea of what they were going to do. And would I tell people, especially young, like my, my, uh, my own kids are in their early 20s and my youngest is a stand-up comedian and my eldest is a music producer. So I'm cursed. So I told them like, if you're going to have a creative life, what's the very most important mm -hmm. is you figure out how to make a living one way or another. I don't care what you do. You could work in a bakery or you could do something tangential, you know, but something you don't bring home and make time for your art and make time to develop your art. And then just as importantly, find your people. Find the other people that are doing what you're doing. Find the people that are going to collaborate with you. And in my opinion, that's success. And as far as illustration goes, it changes all the time. You know, like I've been working now for almost 40 years. And when I started, everyone wanted to be a magazine illustrator. I want to do editorial illustration. I want to get on the cover of Time magazine. Well, no, no one even reads magazines anymore. The internet hadn't even been invented when I graduated from college. And everyone I know is still kicking because they went with the flow. If you have a creative mind and you can you know, create imagery, you will have work. You will have work, but you need to, you need to find that path. It, there's, it's not a formula. Uh, so Melanie had a question about approaching client work, and I thought it was interesting that you, you know, you talked about Forager, I think it was Forager, and you hadn't even had a conversation with, I with your so. contact. I guess Can so. you talk about that a little bit? I got, I got really lucky on both those books with Algonquin because of my friend Laura recommending me. She was really well respected. And based on the snail book, I've gotten other um, book work. Um, before when I had to look for work and really the best way to look do not go on LinkedIn and see what people are looking for don't enter contests don't ever enter contests don't do that they're the money that they're paying in prize money some intelligent person should have been looking for an illustrator and pay that illustrator I hate contests can you tell um 
But the thing to do is if you want to still, even if you want to um, illustrate for the Atlantic or the New York Times or something, find out who the art director is, find out their email address. But Ian, here's a trick. This is a small enough room. I'll let you know this. People don't expect a phone call. They don't expect a phone call. Call them up, freak them out. Say that you're in your 20s, know that, and you know how to use a phone and ask them a question, ask them how you could get in touch with them. Um, you are in a magic area if you're in your 20s that you can call old people like me and we love to hear from you. It makes us still feel alive. You know, I highly recommend calling people or sending a postcard if you actually physically know where they are. Um, otherwise, go to events, go to like the SCBWI conference is like you will get work. If you bring a portfolio there, if you start networking, if you join your local group, you will learn how to do it. They will walk you through getting a picture book made. They will walk you through meeting an art director, meeting a creative director and showing. They will tell you what should be in your portfolio. Um, you know, look for other people and don't rely on it. Yes, have a great Instagram, have a consistent Instagram, follow people, but you're not going to get paid for your likes. You know, that's not how it works. I have sold things that I've posted on Instagram, but I could, you know, I do know people who do earn a living posting things on Instagram. I can tell you not to do that, but there's other ways of connecting with people that are going to pay you for your art. Um, if you if you really, really like a book cover, find out who designed it. They want to see your work, you know, get in touch with them and tell them, I love the cover on this book and that you did that, you know, that that's great for them to hear that. If you do contact someone looking for work, be able to tell them what they did that you thought was so great. And so it doesn't look like you're just spamming everybody. Um, if you want to do a pattern, a surface design, and you're in a store and you're like, oh, that's an amazing greeting card, or that's an amazing folder, turn it over. Who made it? You know, go on, go on LinkedIn and see who the creative director or the art director or the designer is for that manufacturer or for that greeting card company and contact them directly. Um, you know, be a be a private eye. <laughs> find those, find those people. Are there any um, artists or illustrators who you would recommend who, you, who are really exciting you right now that we should be looking at? I, I love uh, Rafael Lopez. He's a children's book illustrator. He lives in San Diego. He's done like big murals there and stuff. And it, this past year, he did a set of stamps for the U.S. Postal Service mariachi stamps. He's amazing. Um, you know, that I'm not really like looking at a lot of illustrators these days. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I, I still love like Lane Smith's work, you know, like the, you know, old people like me. And what are your favorite tool, digital tools right now? Oh boy. Um, I'm just looking at my desktop. I've got everything. I have the entire Adobe suite. Um, I'm an expert level on all of the Adobe software. I do like uh, using Procreate on the iPad. Um, I like Fresco. Yeah. You mentioned that the illustrations for Forager were not vetted by a scientist. Can you talk, like, is that a normal process? Is that the usual process? I'm curious about that. Yeah, and if this was like, um, if it had been, um, you know, like a field guide that people would be using, there would probably be a botanist um, assigned to the project, but it was a little off to the side and I knew things needed to be accurate. I double checked the Latin names with the creative director. Um, that was like a lot of the initial discussion was just narrowing down everything to the actual exact species because I needed it to be accurate in that way. 
And I actually ended up spending a lot of time at the Museum of Natural History, just running stuff by people, you know, like, oh yeah, that looks fine. Or <laughs> like that, that leaf, show the fur under the leaf, you know, but also in the um, descriptions that Michelle had made, I, there were specific things that she was using the plants for, or things she talked about the plants. And so I, I tried to illuminate those things so that it would go with the copy. Um, yeah, often, often if you're given a natural science illustration, it's attached to, a, it's often commissioned by an organization and a, a scientist wants the illustration themselves. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of, it's kind of baked in. Um, a couple of times I've worked on books where they sent me the Latin name and a package of reference material. And the really great thing about Michelle's book is when I lived in Pasadena, I used to go hiking in the Angeles National Forest all the time. And I had physically interacted with and touched almost every species that I depicted. I think the only one I hadn't was the snow plant which was the weirdest one. And I wish I had seen it. So you're working with the publishing house. You're not working with Michelle necessarily. Are there, no. or are you, right? No, this is an interesting thing about publishing. And uh, it didn't make sense at first. Um, the first time I, I did anything with the publisher, they wouldn't even tell me who the author was. Oh. They're like, we want you to do this. And it really had to do with that, the, the editor, the marketing department, they could, they're picturing a product that they're going to sell. And they like things to go smoothly. And if, what if we didn't get along or what if, you know, like, like that things could go off the rails. And I thought that was really, you know, after working in animation where everyone wanted to meet each other and make things together, I thought it was the craziest thing. And um, almost everyone, like I, the, the author for the snail book, now we know each other, we're really, we actually Zoomed all throughout COVID. It was a godsend. Um, yeah, I tend to get along with people, but I, yeah, I was like, okay, I had to respect that. And I, especially children's books, I think it's really important to know as an illustrator, if you want to do children's books, do not find a writer whose book you're going to illustrate. Don't do that. If you want to have a big book that's in, you know, every store that everyone's going to read their kids and get in every library, it's going to come through a major publisher and the publisher looks at the manuscript and hires the illustrator that matches that manuscript in their opinion. And there's been several children's books that are re-illustrated with different illustrators at different times but it's not connected. Some, you know, some people do go hand in hand at, and they do, you could pitch a project together, but you're cutting your chances in half of getting it published. It's, uh, it's, in, you know, it's an interesting phenomenon, but it makes sense. And that, uh, again, that's SCBWI, they would walk you through that, why that's the case and that you need to just build a good general purpose portfolio and make yourself available. And SCBWI again? The Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators. <laughs> okay, got it. So it's interesting, Michelle, I don't know if you, sorry not to call you out, but, um, you know, last week, Michelle talked about a little bit about her process. And it, similarly, you know, she talked about having to let go. There were certain things that she couldn't make a decision about. And the cover was certainly one of them. I don't know if you have anything to add about that, Michelle. I thought that was really interesting. Yeah, I I didn't meet Susan until I am after. <laughs> I mean, I added her on Facebook. Well, not Facebook, probably on Insta. Instagram, I, yeah. Yeah, Instagram. Um, <laughs> after I saw the galley. I mean, they, they didn't even, they wouldn't even let me see it until yeah. it had already been approved and it was too late. So if I had not liked your illustrations, it would have made no difference whatsoever. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Although I did like them very much. And then, you, you know, I reached out to you, but yeah, you're, it's fascinating the way um, it, you explained it from your side because yeah, they did not, I did ha have someone that I knew and they, Algonquin went just was like, no, this isn't your call. Like, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I was like, okay. So anyway, but you did such a lovely job, Susan. So I'm so grateful. Thank you. It was a, a privilege. Excellent. Thank you both. Stephanie, you have a question? 
Uh, yeah, I actually had a couple of questions. Um, I was wondering, how did it feel to work in like so many different kinds of media with like advertisement and like the movies and the computer games? And like, did you have a favorite amongst those or is um, painting just your real favorite uh, when you moved on from those? I, I think I just I just like making imagery and it it uh, it changes all the time what I want to do and I used to think that was really problematic but enough time's gone by that you know I I'm a jack of all trades um, I'm really really enjoying um, life drawing and sketching uh, you know animals and and plants now. Um, but like I said, I'm starting to paint more. I don't, I don't think I have a favorite. And I, I feel really fortunate that I was given so much opportunity to try so many things out. Wow. Um, and then my other question was, um, what was it like working on that? Um, I think it was with the computer games, how it was classified and you can share it with anyone and you can even have like your significant other go to the party. I thought that was, that was wow. <laughs> It was like the worst, like the, the best thing was like, there was enough other people there. Like, like I said, there was 25 people in the art department. So we knew, we mm -hmm. knew what was up. And, um, you know, like uh, people would ask what we were, we, I think we, some people came up with cover stories. I would just say like, we had to sign a piece of paper. It was so laughable at the end that the technology <laughs> didn't even happen. Um, just ludicrous but while I was working there there was so many of us and we needed to be using the fastest most efficient equipment like we were using like top of you know cutting bleeding edge technology and uh, there were so many of us in the art department that we were a beta testing pod for uh photoshop and when we started that project photoshop did not have layers Photoshop wow. <laughs> did not have, layers. you had to make all these different pictures. If you were going to present to a client, you had to do picture A, picture B. You, you like were using so much space up on your drive, just having all these different files and keeping them organized. And we begged Adobe, like, please, if there's anything you're going to do, because we were using After Effects. Adobe didn't own After Effects. It was owned by a small company in Rhode Island. <laughs> And After Effects had layers. And we were like, look at this, look at this, what you could do. And so not only did they add layers, that was version two of uh, Photoshop. They bought After Effects. And it was you know, partly because we were doing that. So there was, there was the pros to that and working with these amazing, I don't know how, but they found a ton of programmers to work on this. And they, they pay, they were paying handsomely. Like I got my day rate for three years. That was a, a lot of money. And these programmers were paid really well. They were vetted really well. The programmers in charge were vetting. And, and again, this was before the internet was huge. This was before there was Google. If you were a programmer, you were a nerd that probably couldn't talk to people. <laughs> and I had worked in effects houses. They were doing um, 3D animation, CGI, writing the code. Like I worked on a Barbie commercial and there was programmers in the back, five programmers writing code for Barbie's hair. You know, it wasn't, you couldn't buy it out of the box. That's what people were doing. And so these programmers, they somehow found programmers at at and that had social skills that could communicate and collaborate with you. I'm still friends with all these programmers. They went on to have leadership positions because they could run meetings and follow up on communication. And you know, I still know a lot of programmers that just don't do that. They do brilliant code and they need you know, a different situation. But yeah, that was the upside of it being top secret. You know, That's what made it worth uh, doing that project. That's amazing. Thank you for, for sharing that with us. That's, that's awesome. Well, thank you all for being here. And a huge thanks to you, Susan, for sharing about your history and your educational journey and your process. It's really incredible. We appreciate you all for spending time with us today. And again, huge thanks to you, Susan. Thank you.